So, Cortland Avenue, South Bronx, has one of the most richest histories in the Bronx period. What culminates to what we see today is an indirect correlation between the young and old. Today, we're going to revisit a story we did in the past. This is the right time to tell it due to a couple past videos. As far as at least two upcoming ones, the man we talking about plays a role in them one way or another. His name is Roger Key, but he was known on the streets as Lucci. Lucci is another legend that is not spoken about much, so we telling his story. Lucci was born late 1976 in the South Bronx. He was the second of six children to the same parents. His pops died when he was 11, and by 1516, his girl was pregnant, so he left home, and he and his baby mom started living together. Quick side note, he married her a day before his birthday in 2000. She was a ride or die. Anyway, by the time Lucci was 18, his moms had passed too. Lucci would get into the street, and the road he took would propel him to being one of the most prolific drug dealers of his time. If you know you know. The things we will talk about today is only the tip of the iceberg in a long and serious criminal history which results in Lucci being a career offender. From age 17 until his arrest on his first federal narcotics charges at 21, Lucci was convicted of six serious crimes. Lucci first was convicted of possessing a 22 caliber pistol in the Bronx in 1994 and was sentenced to one year imprisonment. Because of the age of this conviction, Lucci received no criminal history points for possessing this gun. Two months later, and while his gun case was pending, Lucci was again arrested for possessing narcotics, for which he was sentenced to one to three years as imprisonment. Again, because of the age of this conviction, Lucci received no criminal history points. Another two months later, and while his gun and drug cases were pending, Lucci was again arrested and ultimately convicted of criminal sale of a controlled substance. While these three arrests were pending, Lucci was again arrested several months later for criminal sale of a controlled substance. Again, for these four serious convictions, Lucci received no criminal history points. Within two months of being discharged from parole for these serious and multiple crimes, Lucci was arrested for a 1993 murder. Ultimately he was convicted of manslaughter in the first degree. Later in the story, you will hear how Lucci hired others to do his dirty work, so that he could try to distance himself from acts of violence. For the 1993 murder, Lucci himself shot his victim in the head and hand. For this killing, Lucci was sentenced to 7 to 14 years as imprisonment, resulting in three criminal history points. Finally, in 1999, Judge Denise Cote sentenced Lucci to 135 months imprisonment and five years as supervised release for his participation in a conspiracy to distribute 138 grams of crack and 70 grams of heroin. This federal conviction resulted in an additional three criminal history points. While Lucci received an additional two criminal history points for committing the instant offenses while on supervised release, he was able to trick his probation officer during the pendency of his supervision, who noted that, by all outward appearances, Lucci adjusted well to supervision. He was gainfully employed, re-established a good relationship with his wife and children, reported as directed and never tested positive for drugs. Indeed, a cooperating witness, Melvin, testified that Lucci essentially had a no-show job with a construction company, which he used to claim legitimate employment to probation. Another cooperating witness testified that Lucci maintained a hooty, a run-down car, so that probation would not be alerted by the myriad of luxury cars Lucci possessed. That's just a quick profile, let's go in a lit deeper though, pause. Lucci would rise to be at the very top of a large-scale drug operation. For years, the operation was responsible for selling and distributing much of the drugs sold on the streets of the New York City. Specifically, the drug trafficking charges in this case arose out of the government's investigation into a criminal organization that operated in Upper Manhattan and the Bronx. The investigation involved, at various stages, the FBI, the DEA, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, ATF, and the NYPD. In or about the early 1990s, Lucci began selling street-level quantities of crack cocaine and heroin in and around the Jackson and Melrose housing projects near Cortland Avenue. 
While Lucci spent much of the 1990s and 2000s in prison following a New York State manslaughter conviction, a New York State firearms conviction, three New York State narcotics convictions, and a federal narcotics conviction, the proof demonstrated that shortly after he was released from federal prison, and by in or about 2010, through violence, intimidation, and careful organization, Lucci grew to become a high-level drug distributor in New York City. Through the time of his arrest in 2012, Lucci regularly distributed to major drug organizations in Manhattan and the Bronx millions of dollars of cocaine and crack. Lucci also continued to oversee his own street-level drug distribution organization, which operated, among other areas in the city, in and around the Cortland projects. Specifically, Lucci and his associate, Orlando, oversaw a crew of crack cocaine distributors that operated out of an apartment building located at 321 East 153rd Street. Lucci used several young men, including a number of young teenagers, to sell crack cocaine. The Lucci crew operated in and around the Cortland projects. Beginning in or about 2010, the Lucci crew became involved in a violent conflict over drug trafficking territory with a rival drug crew, which was led by Terry Harrison, aka T-Money. In or about 2010, T-Money's crew, which included dozens of young men who were members of a local gang known as God's Favorite Children, or GFC, also attempted to sell crack cocaine and heroin in and around the Cortland projects. T-Money's crew's drug dealing territory included the area along Cortland Avenue between 149th and 156th Streets, only a few blocks from the 321 building, and the center of the drug trafficking activities of the Lucci crew. At the same time, Lucci's drug trafficking activities reached well beyond the Cortland projects. From in or about 2009 through the time of his arrest, Lucci worked as a drug supplier to high-level traffickers in Manhattan and the Bronx. Specifically, Lucci supplied millions of dollars of cocaine to groups of traffickers in Harlem. One of Lucci's main drug customers during the time period charged in the indictment was Reuben Davis, the leader of a Harlem-based drug trafficking organization. Reuben Davis also went by other names, like Bloody Roo, BR, or Fat Boy. We will do a separate story on him in the future. Anye, Bloody Roo redistributed Lucci's cocaine to street-level crews in Harlem under Bloody Roo's control, who would then sell the cocaine to customers in Harlem and elsewhere in New York City. Furthermore, Lucci personally possessed multiple firearms in connection with his drug dealing. These guns, including a machine gun described by cooperating witness, Aaron, were used to protect his profitable and illicit business, and also in connection with his rivalries with other drug dealers. And, as described below, in connection with the murder for hire of the leader of a rival drug organization, Lucci set into motion events that led to the shooting death of T-Money in broad daylight on a residential and commercial street in the Bronx. For his leadership of this sprawling, violent and lucrative enterprise, Lucci was responsible for the distribution of far in excess of 450 kilograms of cocaine and 25.2 kilograms of crack. On September 10, 2010, T-Money was shot in the face, neck and back, while standing in broad daylight near the Cortland projects on a street with both homes and commercial properties. T-Money had been shot by a lone, hooded gunman, later identified as Kevin Wilson and died at the scene. As proven at trial, over the course of 2010, T-Money and his crew had grown and was now running an extremely lucrative 24 hours per day, 7 days per week drug dealing business along Cortland Avenue. Unlike Lucci, T-Money had not grown up in the Cortland projects. He was an outsider who was attempting to encroach upon what Lucci saw as his own territory. The rapid growth in T-Money's drug business and its increasing share of the drug customers in and around the Cortland projects did not go unnoticed by Lucci and his more established crew of dealers. Accordingly, Lucci worked with others, including members of the 321 crew, to hire and arm Wilson to kill T-Money. Lucci's goal in orchestrating T-Money's murder was clear. To remove his drug trafficking rival and to take back control of the drug selling territory in and around the Cortland projects. Indeed, after Wilson shot and killed T-Money, it was Lucci himself who met Wilson, handed him $1,000 in cash for carrying out the murder, and thanked Wilson for killing his rival. In their about fall 2011, Lucci hired another person, Gia, to kill a guy named Matthew Allen, aka Scar. Lucci told Gia that Lucci wanted to kill Scar, because Scar was abusing Scar's then-girlfriend, and Lucci's low Lucci joined, Aisha. Indeed, Aisha sent text messages to Lucci chronicling the abuse. 
Lucci also stated that Aisha's family was involved in importing large quantities of cocaine from South America. Lucci, due to his need to fuel the large-scale cocaine distribution network under his control, wanted to ingratiate himself into Aisha's family to shore up an additional supply of powder cocaine. Lucci showed Gia a picture of Scar that Aisha had sent to Lucci using her cell phone. This photograph was subsequently recovered from an iPhone that was in Lucci's possession at the time of his arrest in September 2012. When Lucci asked Aisha for the photograph of Scar, he talked in code and referred to the photograph as the homework. Giyu took a photograph of the picture stored on Lucci's phone, so he could identify whom Lucci had hired Gia to kill. Gia agreed to commit the murder in exchange for $10,000 cash. Over the next several weeks, Gia and Lucci had a series of discussions about how to commit the murder. Gia preferred to use a silencer. Lucci gave Gia two firearms to use to kill Scar, one revolver and one semi-automatic pistol. In the thick of the plot and about a month before the November 16, 2011 attempt on Scar's life, Aisha texted Lucci and told him that she wanted to seal the deal. Lucci immediately responded K. Lucci also gave Aisha a firearm to keep at her home. In another coded text message, Aisha told Lucci that she had stored it in the garage, but would move it closer to her when Scar went to sleep. Gia and Lucci traveled together to a spy store in Manhattan and purchased a portable GPS tracking device, which Lucci wanted Gia to affix to Scar's SUV in order to track and kill Scar. Aisha drove Scar's car to Gia's apartment in the Bronx, where Gia and Lucci placed the GPS device underneath the carriage of Scar's SUV. This is corroborated by cell sites mapping the phones utilized by Lucci, Aisha and Gia. On or about November 16, 2011, Gia received a call from Lucci, who told Gia that Scar was on his way to 302 Brooklyn Avenue, Scar's parole address. Aisha had informed Lucci that Scar was on this way home for the night. Lucci told Gia to meet him on 7th Avenue in Harlem in order to pick up a shooter, Capriata, who was supplied by one of Lucci's biggest cocaine customers. Gia met Lucci and Capriata at 115th Street and 7th Avenue in Harlem. Gia and Capriata then drove to Brooklyn, to 302 Brooklyn Avenue, an address Lucci had already taken Gia to when they were planning the murder of Scar. That night, Gia was driving an Audi Q7 car, which was provided by Lucci and registered in the name of Lucci's wife. The Audi and license plate was captured on license plate readers on the drive to and back from Brooklyn. During the ride to Brooklyn with Capriata, Gia provided to Capriata a 38 revolver, which Lucci had provided to Gia earlier. At the Brooklyn address, Gia parked his car and waited with Capriata. A few minutes later, Scar's Escalade arrived. Gia then let Capriata out of Lucci's Audi and drove around the block as Capriata began to approach what they believed to be Scar's SUV. Gia then drove back to the original location and picked up Capriata. Capriata told Gia that he had shot the target. Gia then drove Capriata back to the same location in Harlem, where he had first picked him up. Gia also took back the 38 revolver from Capriata. Lucci and Bloody Rue were waiting at the location in Harlem and told Gia that the wrong person had been shot. In fact, an innocent bystander was shot three times. Although this bystander survived his wounds, he suffered a collapsed lung, underwent several surgeries, and still has a bullet lodged in his chest. Lucci knew that Capriata and Gia had shot the wrong person because soon after the shooting, Scar called Aisha and told her that his neighbor had been shot. In turn, Aisha called Lucci and reported back that they had shot the wrong person and that Scar was still alive. These sequence of phone calls are corroborated by the phone records of Lucci, Aisha and Scar. Lucci nevertheless paid Gia approximately $7,500 in cash that night, which Gia understood as payment to ensure that Gia was going to finish the job and kill the correct target, Matthew Scar. Lucci later informed Gia that Capriata was paid the remainder of the balance. Gia subsequently retrieved the GPS from under Scar's car and stored it in his home where it, along with the revolver used in the attempted murder, was recovered by law enforcement, pursuant to a search warrant. Several weeks later, Gia learned from Lucci that Matthew Scar had been killed via text messages from Lucci's cell phone to Gia's cell phone. Following Lucci's arrest for the conspiracy to murder Scar, Lucci worked to destroy evidence of his involvement in the attempted murder of Scar and the shooting of the innocent victim. For example, during an October 19, 2012 prison call with Aisha, Lucci gave her the password to an email or social media account and told her to go into the account, save some pictures and delete the rest, so that these female dogs won't be going into my shit. At the end of all this, Lucci was sentenced to life plus 30 years. 
This will lead us to our first story pertaining to murder morehouses and the revamped story of Melly Meltballer. But this about wraps it up for now, but as always, stay low and thanks for watching.